Hello students and welcome to Unit 5, AP Biology Heredity. Uh, just like all my other videos, this is not for profit. It's only meant to help students and I try to use all pictures of my own or from OpenStax or Khan Academy. This uh, fascinating unit covers meiosis, Mendelian genetics, non-Mendelian genetics, and uh, how the environment can affect phenotype. Up here is a picture of the cat that we're fostering and we call her Lion, named after Mary Lion, who figured out um, X bar X inactivation. And because coat color in calico cats is on the X chromosome, we know that Lion is a female and she's expressing different colors because of the inactivation there. So we'll construct a model for that later. Here are my children and uh, we can uh, see how traits are passed on through meiosis and genetic diversity. So let's jump in. Topic 5.1 is meiosis. And this one's just saying like kind of how does it work? Can you model it? Can you compare and contrast mitosis and meiosis? So I encourage you to pause the uh, show here and see if you can do these. So I like to say it's a story of you, right? We need to put this all into context. Meiosis is in this part. If this is you and you're happy at Tasem and then you grow up and later on you want to start a family and you'll be making sex cells to do that, sperm or eggs. When they're combined together, right, those traits are passed on and we call that genetics and it will make a fertilized egg. That's a zygote. This zygote will continue to grow and divide and reproduce um, and that's through mitosis or cellular division. Um, there will be signals to the cells to become uh, specialized and we will get different tissues and organs in the body and that is called cellular specialization. You'll continue to grow uh, or your children will continue to grow until they reach uh, adult size and that's through the process of mitosis and they'll keep doing mitosis to replace worn out or dead cells. If mitosis goes wrong as we learned in unit four then we can have something like cancer. Throughout this time, we're maintaining homeostasis uh, in our bodies and the process keeps going through, right? A segment of a gene or, or excuse me, a segment of DNA is going to be called a gene that's going to code for RNA, which is going to code for a protein, which makes these physical traits that you see. Here is the one from Khan Academy and OpenStax. So similar picture, but less cluttered, right? Here, the um, this is showing a dipoid. Uh, haploid life cycle. So here, um, diploid individuals, they're making haploid cells in the process of meiosis. These are going to have half the number of chromosomes. Here you'll see that the fertilized cell, 2n is equal to 6. In humans, it's uh, 2n is equal to 46. And you'll see that uh, going through the process of mitosis. All right, I put some cons and pros here. Um, this increases genetic diversity, which will be uh, section 5.2, but it does take time. It takes more time than just reproducing asexually. All right, so here is your comparison of mitosis and meiosis. On this page, we have mitosis. So I remind students that the I in mitosis stands for identical. We're making identical cells. Here we're starting out with two chromosomes, 2n is equal to 2, and we're going to end with two chromosomes, 2n is equal to 2, and they should be genetically identical identical. During uh, prophase, or well, starts during interphase, right? There's G1, S, and G2. The cell grows. It copies its DNA during the S phase, and it prepares to divide. During prophase, the chromosomes condense. Uh, during metaphase, they align along the equator. So P for prep, M for middle. Anaphase, A for away, the chromosomes are starting to pull apart. And in telophase, uh, the two cells are split in cytokinesis and you're going to have the identical daughter cells. So let's look at meiosis and see some differences here. In this one, we're starting with 2n is equal to 4 and we end up with just two chromosomes in each cell. So we're already seeing that one of the big differences between meiosis and mitosis is a reduction in half in the number of chromosomes. This actually happens during meiosis 1. And the reason it happens during meiosis one is because the homologous chromosomes line up in pairs. So here's homologous pair number one, and here's homologous pair number two. The pairs then get pulled across to the other side of the cells. Because we count chromosomes right here at the middle in the centromere, we can now say we have two chromosomes in each cell, whereas we started with four. All right. Um, 
this right here is going to be random in which order they line up, and we'll emphasize that later for genetic diversity. It then does not go through another replication phase. It just goes from telophase to prophase two, and it's going to undergo the process again. And so you can see here how meiosis evolved from mitosis. So now let's talk about the meiosis and genetic diversity. So can you describe and model how meiosis promotes genetic diversity? So there's a really three big ways. And so the first one is going to be crossing over. And so there's special enzymes that help uh, when homologous uh, chromosomes uh, line up and form a tetrad. These uh, enzymes will help them swap segments or swap genes. This happens in every pair of chromosomes um, in, in chromosome numbers one through 22 in humans, and it can happen with differing frequencies. So here you see anywhere between four, three, one, or two crossover events. Um, and there can even be a little bit of crossing over with the X and Y in what's called the pseudo autosomal region, but usually uh, we don't say there's a lot of swapping there because the X chromosome has many more genes than the Y does. So crossing over is one of them, right? When they form a uh, pair, um, a tetrad, and so the homologous chromosomes lie on top of each other, they can actually exchange segments of genetic material. This makes unique combinations of genes that weren't um, in the cells beforehand. And so this is going to create genetic diversity. Another one, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be the random assortment of the homologous pairs in metaphase. So here, blue, red, blue, red, or it could be blue, red, red, blue. So it could be different combinations of paternal and maternal chromosomes. So between this and crossing over, no gamete or sex cell will be the same. Um, if you want to figure out the number of different possible ways that chromosomes can line up in uh, gamete cells for humans, it'd be two to the 23rd power because we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And it gives you over 8 million possible combinations. The third one that I didn't picture in here is that it's random which sperm and egg uh, match up, right? Um, unless it was in an IVF clinic or something, it's going to be random. And so it's another contributor to genetic diversity. That was meiosis. I would strongly encourage you to draw it out and model it. I feel like just taking notes on it really doesn't do it justice, but to try and um, draw out those chromosomes and see what happens when you uh, engage in crossing over uh, really helps you to see the genetic diversity of play. Topic 5.3 is dealing with Mendelian genetics. It starts with kind of a review that um, DNA and proteins um, are, and RNA are common throughout all life and ribosomes as well. So therefore, these genes can um, be passed on in DNA and it can be read throughout uh, all life forms. And then we get into the work that Mendel did and we see these Mendelian laws. So can you make a concept map with these words, genes, homologous chromosomes, alleles, DNA, protein? Can you describe common ancestry? And then can you use probability and statistics to explain Mendelian inheritance? I did not in this uh, screencast go over chi-square. I'll do that in a separate one with um, biostatistics, but you'll need to be able to do that here with Mendelian genetics. So um, here's uh, just concept map or some pictures I took from Wikimedia. Um, so here you can see a cell and inside of it is the nucleus. This would be a eukaryotic cell. And inside the nucleus would be your DNA in the uh, chromosomes, right? And a section of DNA is called a gene. And that section of DNA codes for a protein. And so here would be an example of homologous pair. And so here we've got um, two different genes. And this one's coming from parent number one, and this one's coming from parent number two. We could say from dad and from mom. All right. And so here dad's going to give you the tall allele, and mom's also going to give you a tall allele. So this plant is going to be homozygous for tall. So homozygous dominant for tall. And then dad's going to give you a wrinkled uh, pea, and then mom's going to give you a smooth pea. So this plant is going to be heterozygous for wrinkled and smooth. And smooth will be dominant over wrinkled. So that will be the phenotype here. But then due to the law of segregation, when this plant passes on its genes to the next generation, it will pass on just one of these chromosomes, and it can't choose which one. So let's see if we got all the words right. 
right? We have homologous pairs. So these would be like, we could say that this is chromosome pair number three in the um, plant. I'm not sure which one it really is. Um, alleles are forms of a gene. So tall, wrinkled, smooth, tall, those are all alleles. And then you have DNA, proteins, and genes. So uh, as humans, right, we have 23 homologous pairs of chromosomes. We have 30,000 genes, so there's going to be a lot of them on each chromosome. Uh, genetics and Mendel's work really help to disprove blending. It's um, really hard for students to think of genetics not as a blend. And I completely get it, right? Like I am half Asian. My dad's uh, Irish and English, and my mom was Japanese. Um, so I kind of come out as a mix of the two of them. But what's really happening in my body is that there's a lot of different Punnett squares and it's all contribute to biochemical pathways to secrete melanin. And then those interactions together give me a final product. But if there was blending, if you bred this tall and a short plant, and you got a medium plant, all the plants from then on out would be medium, right? You would never get tall or short again. And so what Mendel proved with his uh, work with pea plants is that there isn't blending. Tall, short, they came out tall. And then when you bred these F1 tall plants again, you got three quarters of them tall and one short. So the short gene was there. It was just hidden in that F1 generation. It wasn't blended together. So the law of segregation is that only one copy of a gene is put into each egg or sperm cell. So here we have the P generation, P for Mendel is pure breeding. They always came out yellow or green. When they produce uh, gametes, it's gonna always be a big Y or a little Y, right? Because these were pure breeding. So they're homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive. We cross the P generation to make the F1 generation. Here we got heterozygotes. So um, big Y, little Y, they were always yellow. Now the gametes can either have a big Y or a little Y, and it's gonna be random, right? The, the You can't choose which um, allele you're gonna pass on. And so here we set up a Punnett square and on the outside, we put each type of gamete that is possible. So when we cross the F1s, we have big Y, little Y, big Y, little Y, and we get the three to four uh, classic Mendelian ratio. So this is the law of segregation says that only one gene or uh, one allele is passed on and that it's random. The law of independent assortment says that genes are passed on independently of each other. So if they depended on each other, or if they had to be together, then you would always get yellow and round and you'd always get green and wrinkled. But we could see down here that here's a green and round, green and round, green and round, and here's a yellow wrinkled, yellow wrinkled, yellow wrinkled. So there was some recombination of traits. Now we know that this is violated quite often and it's violated, uh, for example, with uh, red hair and freckles, right? We have a lot of genes on the same chromosome. If they're on the same chromosome and close together, they're more likely to be inherited together and they will not follow the law of independent assortment. So when you're taking AP uh, genetics questions or you're taking an AP test, you should look for this. If the test tells you, does it follow independent assortment? Do the alleles assort independently? And they have to give that to you in the question. Um, if they say that, then you can assume that they're on different chromosomes or that they're far enough apart that they uh, fulfill Mendelian principles. And if not, then they're linked together. And we'll go over linked genes later on. All right. So here would be a nine to three to three to one ratio um, for the Mendelian dihybrid. So two heterozygotes. Now you can do a chi-square test to see if something is following Mendel's principles and you would make Mendelian principles the null hypothesis. Um, we worked a lot on this in class here at Tazem, and so you would need to look at what the problem is giving you, and there are some good ones on AP Classroom, and a lot of times they'll help steer you towards what is the null hypothesis. Sometimes they'll say, we're testing a null hypothesis that it's sex linked. And so um, a lot of times they'll, if, if they're doing a Mendelian problem, they're gonna be testing the null hypothesis that it's following Mendelian ratios. And then if it's not, you're probably gonna make an argument that it's linked genes, or maybe it's non-nuclear inheritance, or maybe it's caused by the environment. All right, so you needed to be able to do some uh, statistics with it. Sorry, this is supposed to be animated. And so here, what is the probability of getting from uh, crossing these um, a heterozygote 
big B, little B, big C, little C. Well, you could do the whole dihybrid, right? And so to do a dihybrid, you do foil first, outer, inner, last. Sorry, is it first, outer, inner, last. And all that does is help give you all the possible gametes. So something I emphasize with my ninth grade students over and over again is that the outside of a Punnett square are gametes or sex cells. I can tell that they're gametes because they just have one version of each gene, the B1 or uh, the C1 here. So now if I go back, a trick to this is when we say um, BB and CC, if we're using the word and, we mean multiply. So we can use the multiplication rule. So we're going to do the monohybrid Punnett square for uh, fur color and the monohybrid fur, uh, Punnett square for fur texture. And so here, the probability of getting um, the heterozygote is one half and the probability of getting the heterozygote here is one half. Multiply those two together and you get one fourth. All right. Believe it or not, I see a lot of mistakes sometimes with numerators and denominators and multiplying fractions. All right. A lot of times they'll say, well, um, what's the probability of getting, say, dark or yellow, uh, yellow fur with uh, smooth ears, right? So then if it's yellow fur and smooth ears, it'd be 1 over 4 and 3 over 4. So it would be 3 over 16 following that Mendelian ratio. So sometimes they just want the phenotype. Sometimes they'll want the uh, actual genotype. All right, and you can always prove it with a dihybrid. Um, now, let's say, what's the probability of getting the, the heterozygote form? Or what if we got the all homozygous recessive, right? And so we could look at it and we could do the dihybrid and add them up and you would get these ones are the heterozygote. Here's that homozygous recessive, so it'd be 5 over 16. Or you could do the math. Um, well, yeah, but well, that's what we would do, right? Or um, you could calculate each event and then add them together because they are mutually exclusive. So if we see the word or, we're doing the sum rule as long as they are mutually exclusive. So here, 4 over 16 plus 1 over 16 is equal to 5 over 16. All right. So um, that was Mendelian genetics. And so I would encourage you to do some practice problems with uh, dihybrids and then um, doing some practice problems with the chi-square uh, test statistic. So now we're going to get into non-Mendelian genetics. And, um, you know, this is uh, things like linked genes, uh, non-nuclear inheritance, sex-linked traits, um, and then I put in pedigrees here, right? Can you explain deviations from this and can you construct arguments here? So first and foremost, many traits are the product of multiple genes and therefore do not segregate Mendelian patterns. So um, one of my students did a case study on eye color and he did a really good job. And I looked it up in a nature paper and there's like 16 different genes responsible for eye color. There's um, two big ones, the OCA2 gene and I believe the GAI gene. And so the OCA2 is epistatic to the other one, but there's a lot at play. It's not as simple as like a four box pun and square on whether or not you have brown or blue eyes. Then there could be mutations and there could be epigenetic factors that happen. Um, I still think it's helpful to learn Mendelian principles because then we can see the complexity uh, going on for these traits. All right, linked versus unlinked. Linked genes are going to be close together on uh, the same chromosome. And if they're close together on the same chromosome, because of how meiosis works, they're more likely to be inherited together. The only way they won't be inherited together is if there's crossing over with those enzymes where you get swapping of parts of the chromosome and that crossing over has to happen in between the two genes. So genes two and three are really close together. They're more likely to be inherited together. Whereas genes two and four aren't, they're more likely to have the recombinant come up. So let's see it. This one is from Khan Academy and this is showing um, meiosis. And this is showing uh, two traits, A and B or two genes and the dominant and recessive allele. And so this person is heterozygous for both A and for B. And so this person can make the following sex cells. They can make um, a big A, big B. Um, they can make the recessive. They can make uh, a heterozygous um, in either way, right? And so these can be passed on and will go, um, you know, can be part of the Punnett square. 
Now here, if they're on the same chromosome, you can make all these gametes, but notice how you're much more likely to get them together, the dominant A and B, because they're together in the same chromosome, and the recessive A and B, because they're together in the same chromosome. The only time that you get the um, dominant A with a recessive B is if there's crossing over in between them. And so that's much less likely to happen if they're um, very close together. And so you would have a smaller number of recombinants. So the re what was responsible for it was for crossing over. So let's see this in action. And this is from Khan Academy. Um, and they have an excellent tutorial on it that I would encourage you to walk through um, if you've had trouble with linked genes. And so it's been a while in our class since we've done them. So um, I hope you find this review helpful. Here's the pure breeding uh, generation. So these are always going to come out red eyes and normal wings. And these are always going to come out purple eyes and vestigial wings. So when we cross them, the F1 generation comes out like the uh, like this one, red eyes and normal wings. So we now know that red eyes and normal wings are going to be dominant, right? And so we mark those with what's called a plus sign here for the wild type. And then the mutant is going to be those purple eyes and vestigial wings. So this this blue PR and this blue VG, this stands for the mutant right here. So this fly is going to have, um, you know, one copy for red eye and one copy for purple. So it's going to be red because red's dominant. And one copy for normal wings and one copy for vestigial wings. But the normal wings are dominant. Now we can cross that F1 with a tester. We could cross it with another F1. Right? And if they're unlinked, then we would expect a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. But here we're going to do um, a tester. And so the tester is always going to be homozygous recessive. And the reason is then we know exactly what is in the tester's sperm or eggs. So let's go ahead. What are the possible egg or sperm cells of the red fly? There could be uh, the following combinations, right? And so this is doing foil first, outer, inner, last, or just thinking through what are all the possible combinations of the red eye, the um, purple eye, and the vestigial wing, and the normal wing. Now for the tester, we know that uh, the tester is homozygous recessive, so we only the only sperm or egg that the tester can make is going to be that purple eye and vestigial wing. So the nice thing about this, and we did it a couple times on the board here, you only need to fill in four boxes. You don't need to do the whole 16 box Punnett square. So if we uh, fill it out and we do it here, we're going to get for this one, right? The bottom one's always going to be those purple eyes and those vestigial wings. And the top will be um, these different combinations. So this fly is going to be uh, just like the parental. This one's going to be just like the parental. And then these are going to be recombinant. So this one's going to have red eyes, but vestigial wings. And this one's going to have purple eyes, but normal wings. So if the genes were not linked and you did this, what would you expect to get? And hopefully you would expect to get 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%. You get a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio. If they're linked, you're not going to get that. And so the, uh, we already went over the parental ones, sorry, and the recombinant ones. Um, and we already answered that question. My bad. And so if they're linked, you're going to get much fewer of the recombinants. You'll get less than 50%. And that's because the only way that they can be combined together is through crossing over between the genes. So here you'll see a greater likelihood of getting the parental flies and a smaller likelihood of getting the recombinant ones. So um, Thomas Hunt Morgan and Alfred Sturdivant figured this out and used it to make linkage maps and some really cool stuff. And so this is telling us because it's not one to one to one to one, instead it's going to be much greater for parental and much less, less than 50% for recombinant that these genes are linked. They're on the same chromosome. So can you make some logic statements about the recombinants? If the recombinants appear less than 50% of the time, then their genes are linked. The closer the two genes are, the more likely they're to be inherited together. Um, and so that's the same thing. And therefore, the lower the percentage of recombinants, the closer two genes are. You can use this if you have um, 
if you have three genes of interest um, and you see them on the same chromosome, you can use them to make a map. You can start to think of where genes are on a chromosome. And so what we can see here is that gene A and gene B cross over about 6% of the time. So they're making that recombinant about 6% of the time. B and C make the recombinant 12.5% of the time. And A and C make the recombinant 18.5% of the time. This won't always add up, and I'll tell you why in a second. So A and C, if they're making more recombinants, more likely to have crossing over in between them, so that means they're further apart on the chromosome. A and B, less likely to make recombinants, so they're less likely to have crossing over between them, closer together on the chromosome, and B and C are kind of in the middle. Then you just got to play with it, and you can figure out a map. Like, how could this work? Well, if I put A and C, because they're the farthest apart, I set them the furthest apart. Then I can work from there. So do the furthest apart genes, or the uh, the most recombinants first, 18.5 map units apart. Then I just got to figure out where to put B. Should I put B close to C or closer to A? And I know that B is about six uh, map units away from A and 12.5 away from C. So it makes sense to put B around here on my map. Now. These numbers might not always add up because of double crossovers. If you remember back to that table I showed you, there can be more than one crossover event uh, that can happen in a cell. All right, pedigrees. So in pedigrees, we're going to determine if a trait is dominant or recessive. This is really important. I see it every year on the AP exam. I think it's a joy to figure these out. Um, if it skips generations, it has to be a recessive trait. Dominant traits can't skip a generation. If both parents are heterozygous and none of the kids, get the trait, and then the trait has died out. You can determine autosomal recessive versus sex link. You look for more males being affected for hinting at sex link. And then you look at moms and sons. So if a female is passing on a recessive disease, her son must have the disease if it is sex link. And then you look at dads and daughters. If a daughter has a disease, her dad has to have it too if it's sex link. And we can look at something, uh, we can look at pedigrees to justify that in just a second. You cannot absolutely say that a trait is sex linked and not autosomal because autosomal could give the same pattern. You can just say that there's great evidence for sex link. You can rule out sex link, but you can never rule out autosomal recessive for that. All right, I have to pause for a second. Okay, can you look at this pedigree and figure out what mode of transmission this might be? All right, pause the video and check. So it could be sex linked or autosomal. So um, uh, autosomal recessive. It can't be dominant, right? It skips a generation. Um, but this could be uh, either sex linked or autosomal. How about this one? Autosomal recessive. Let's look at number 17. If this was sex linked, then uh, the dad here in box nine would have to have the disease, right? Because he only passes on one X. It can't be dominant because look, it skips a generation right here. All right, what about this one? Has to be dominant. Um, so here it's passed on, but if it was homozygous recessive, um, right, then seven would have to have it. Right? If, if two re, uh, parents are autosomal recessive, homozygous recessive, then number seven would have to have it. All right, and then here you can see um, nuclear DNA right, is inherited from all ancestors. Um, we've gone over that in this presentation, but mitochondrial DNA only comes from the mom. There is a little bit of evidence that um, some dad stuff could be used too, but mainly just from the mom. And so we can use that um, to uh, deal with maternal inheritance. So look at this chart right here. You can see mom's going to pass it on to all of her children. Mom passes it on to all of her children, to all of her children. Now these children, this person is not one of her child, right? That married in. This mom is going to pass it on to all of her kids. This dad doesn't. So this pedigree right here shows mitochondrial inheritance. Um, and then we can also look at the Y chromosome, right? Because the Y chromosome is passed down. Um, and I said that there's not a lot of crossing over there. And we've used that to show that Thomas Jefferson uh, raped Sally Hemings, his slave, and fathered children with her, um, one of the presidents of the United States. All right. 5.5 um, uh, environmental effects on phenotype. I, this is fascinating. And it really deals with phenotype 
uh, phenotypic plasticity. And so what I mean right here is that um, you have these genes, right? But they can be influenced by the environment. And so here you can see for these turtles, right? If it's really cold, they're more likely to develop as males. If it's warmer, uh, certain proteins can be activated and are more likely to develop as females. Um, and so here are a lot of illustrative examples. And I think the best way to do this, uh, the, like flower color with hydrangeas, the Arctic fox, sex determination reptiles, um, is to do a little bit of research and to just learn about this um, that way. Um, height and weight in humans, right? If, if you might have the genes to be super tall, but if you don't have good nutrition, then you won't be able to realize your full uh, height. And then uh, last but not least, uh, chromosomal inheritance. So like, I thought in my class that we, we went over these segregation, independent assortment, fertilization, um, and the chromosomal basis of inheritance. So I really think it's this last part right here. What kind of genetic disorders can happen uh, due to non-disjunction? And so non-disjunction is when there's the failure of chromosomes to separate correctly during meiosis. And so here, instead of going from 2n is equal to 4 to n is equal to 2, you end up with cells that are n is equal to 1 and n is equal to 3. So here was that uh, error. They were unable to separate the homologous pair. The non-disjunction could happen in meiosis 1 or 2 and cause these errors. And um, a common example of this is Down syndrome, right? And so here, um, non-disjunction, you have an extra chromosome, number 21. Students, uh, take care. Good luck as you prep for the AP exam. Have a go in. I hope you found this unit interesting. Remember to review chi-square problems, and that will be in a different screencast.